there we go. Um, so now that we're up and running, um, let's jump in and get started. So um, for FY 2023, we saw some pretty um, significant increased funding. So the total funding for HUD in FY 2023 was $61.8 billion, which is an $8.1 billion increase from FY 2022. And my esteemed colleagues are going to really be jumping in and breaking down what those numbers mean for each individual program. Um, but as just kind of a top line and as a reminder of what we were up against in the previous Congress, um, both the House and the Senate proposed FY23 budgets were negotiated without any Republican input last year. And so in order to enact that final FY 2023 bill, appropriations leaders in the House and Senate had to come together to reach a bipartisan bicameral agreement on funding levels, which led to a relatively low top line spending number for HUD programs. But despite this, and thanks to the critical work of advocates around the country and affordable housing champions in Congress, we managed to pull off meaningful increases for many of HUD's programs. So some of that funding includes uh, funding to renew all existing housing choice voucher and project-based rental assistance voucher contracts and to expand assistance to an additional 12,000 households, increased funding for vital programs, including HUD's homeless assistance grants account, public housing operating funds, section 202 and section 811, among other programs. Um, we saw level funding for the community development block grant and home program and slightly decreased funding, unfortunately, for HUD's Healthy Homes Initiative and public housing capital funds. This year, we are looking at a divided Congress that presents some new challenges. As I'm sure everyone knows, um, we are now in a divided Congress with Republicans taking control of the House and Democrats maintaining control of the Senate. And of course, the Biden administration still in the White House. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has made several promises to far right members of his party um, in order to secure his speakership, including a promise to slash federal spending in exchange for raising the debt ceiling. We were in a very, very similar fight back in 2011 when a Republican controlled House demanded steep budget cuts in exchange for raising the debt ceiling, which resulted in the, the enactment of the Budget Control Act of 2011. And that Budget Control Act imposed strict low spending caps on domestic and defense programs for a decade. HUD's affordable housing construction and preservation programs were some of the hardest hit by those spending caps enacted under the Budget Control Act. And even after the increased appropriations for the FY 2023 budget that I just covered, HUD has still received $29 billion less than it would have had annual appropriations stayed at FY 2010 levels and just adjusted for inflation. That's still a $29 billion deficit. Um, Speaker McCarthy has also pledged to uh, cap FY 2024 spending at FY 2022 levels, which would result in, for HUD programs, at least an $8.1 billion decrease to HUD's vital funding programs. And um, a, a recent analysis from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities states that, um, that such a, a spending cap at FY 22 levels could result in an average cut of 24% to non-defense discretionary programs, depending on how that, uh, that, that budget shakes out. So all of that is to say that your advocacy is needed now more than ever. Um, I'm going to be popping some links in the chat during our conversation today um, with ways that you can take action. And at the end of the call, I'm also going to be highlighting a sign-on letter from the Campaign on Housing and Community Development Funding urging Congress to not only defend against any proposed spending cuts to HUD and USDA's vital affordable housing, community development, and homelessness assistance programs, but also urging them to provide the highest level possible for those vital programs. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Linda to move us through our agenda. Terrific. Thank you, Kim. And I'm going to pass it over to cover some public housing operating and capital fund issues with Cynthia Questis from the Council of Large Public Housing Agencies. Hi, everybody. Hi. 
My name is Cynthia Corsis, and I am the Legislative Assistant for the Council of Large Public Housing Authorities. CLAFA is a nonprofit organization that works to preserve and improve public and affordable housing through advocacy, research, policy, and public education. Thank you. And next slide. So today I will discuss FY23 funding levels related to public housing. Specifically, I will focus on the Public Housing Operating and Capital Fund and the Choice Neighborhood Initiative. And next slide, thank you. Okay, so here's a general chart that shares FY23 funding levels related to public housing. In total, public housing received $8.514 billion this fiscal year, which will remain available until September 30, 2025. I will not go into detail for every funding type for the sake of time, but I'll share my email if anyone has questions about these funding levels. Thank you, next slide. Public housing is mainly funded through two streams, which are listed here. The Public Housing Operating Fund is the only major source of federal funding available to assist in operating and maintenance expenses of public housing. The operating fund received $5.109 billion total for FY23, which is $70 million above FY22 enacted levels. The Public Housing Capital Fund is the principal source of funding for the rehabilitation and modernization improvements to public housing units. The Capital Fund received $3.2 billion for FY23, which is equal to the FY22 enacted level. I don't have a lot of time to dive into the issues, but wanted to briefly share that Congress has not adequately funded public housing for decades. Years of underfunding and disinvestment have been detrimental to the fabric of our nation's housing stock and stability. CLAFA believes more federal funding for public housing are necessary to better preserve existing stock, provide appropriate operating support to public housing authorities, and to assist low-income families in having safe, decent, and affordable homes. And the last one. Thank you. And oh, the next slide, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And the Choice Neighborhood Initiative, also known as CNI, uh, provides grants to revitalize distressed and high poverty neighborhoods and can also be used to transform older public housing units. And this funding type received 350 million for FY23. No less than 175 million of this funding may be made available to housing authorities. And this is 350 million equal to the FY22 enacted level. And yeah, uh, next slide. And thank you. Please let me know if you have any questions. And here's my email. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Cynthia, very much. I'm going to turn over to Sonia Acosta with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, who's going to talk with us about housing choice vouchers and tenant-based rental assistance. Thanks, Linda. Hi, everyone. I'm Sonia Acosta with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Great to be with you. Happy Friday. Uh, thanks for talking budget with us on a Friday afternoon. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, I'll be talking through the tenant-based rental assistance account today, which includes the housing choice voucher program and special vouchers and associated administrative fees. So overall, the fiscal year 2023 bill provided $30.3 billion for this account, which was an increase of $2.9 billion over um, fiscal year 2022 levels. That's about a 10.5% increase. So let's kind of dig into where those increases were within the account. So first, um, like Kim mentioned earlier, the bill funds housing vouchers for about 11,700 additional households. So $50 million was appropriated for new housing choice vouchers that don't have kind of specific um, population targets. And that's about uh, 5,000 households. And then uh, the rest are funded through special purpose vouchers like hud Bash and Family Unification Program. The bill also includes a significant increase uh, for tenant protection vouchers of about $237 million. This increase is really to help with public housing conversions through the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program uh, known as RAD. This is gonna be really helpful in particular for the New York City Housing Authority, um, which has the largest public housing portfolio in the country and is doing a lot of work to try to preserve affordable housing opportunities there. Uh, the FY 2023 bill also provides an increase of $367 million for administrative fees to help housing agencies assist people effectively and efficiently. HUD estimates that this level of funding will meet about 91% of housing agencies' eligibility. 
So this is a similar uh, rate of proration to last year. I believe last year is about 92%. And both of those are a bit higher than what it's been in the past where it's been kind of in the mid to high 80s. So those increased administrative fees are really helpful because HUD has clarified that those admin fees can be used to cover security deposits, uh, utility deposits, application fees, landlord incentives, and other activities that can really help households utilize their vouchers, particularly in tight rental markets. We can go to the next slide. Speaking of tight rental markets, um, it's really great and important that Congress provided funding to renew existing housing vouchers, uh, despite some really high rental increases. So Congress provided $26.4 billion to renew existing housing vouchers. It's a $2.3 billion increase or about 9.6%, which is quite high. Um, but this increase was really critical for ensuring that households don't lose their assistance. Like I said, rents have increased dramatically in the past year or so, and HUD adjusted how it calculates its fair market rents, which helped determine subsidy levels um, to better account for those higher rental costs. Um, so the new higher fair market rents will help families utilize their vouchers more easily in this current rental market, but it does mean that renewal costs had to increase. Fortunately, Congress met this need and the vouchers will be fully renewed. Within kind of this larger pot of renewals, there's a set aside of $7.5 million for Tribal Head Bash, which is a slight increase over recent years, again, to try to help um, meet cost increases. And the same is true for the Section 811 Mainstream Voucher Program, which has a separate pot of funding for renewals. And as we think forward to fiscal year 2024, um, Congress will again need to provide increased funding to ensure the voucher program does not end up serving fewer people. Increases in rent costs have slowed down recently, um, but they will be higher as it is, as is true every year, um, meaning less or even the same amount of funding would help fewer households. So a long-term continuing resolution Budget cuts could mean that rental assistance, which currently only serve one in four eligible households anyway, would help even fewer people. So it's really important for Congress, fortunately, um, to add a little bit of hope. Uh, even during the years of spending caps under the Budget Control Act, Congress was generally pretty good about funding voucher renewals. Um, so there's at least, at least that little bit of um, positive news and I will pass back to Linda. Great, thanks Sonia, appreciate that. And um, as I said, I'm Linda Couch with Leading Age and I'm going to cover uh, section eight, project-based rental assistance. Next slide, please. Um, as you just heard from Sonia around the vouchers, not getting uh, being fully renewed for FY23. The same has happened with Section 8 project based rental assistance. The money that Congress provided in the FY23 appropriations bill is sufficient for full renewal funding for all the project based rental assistance contracts, which is terrific news and is something that um, Congress um, does perennially seem interested in making sure happens. There's also language in the project based rental assistance account to provide authority. HUD also asked for about $275 million to carry this out. Congress didn't provide the money, but Congress did provide authority um, for HUD to increase post mark to market rents and PBRA communities or to renew contracts um, for the post mark to market properties at levels equal to the lesser of budget based rents or comparable market rents. And this is um, only where um, um, HUD can only do this at the request of an owner who demonstrates that project income is insufficient to operate or maintain the project, even if there's no rehab necessary, 
or a rent adjustment or a renewal contract at higher rents is necessary to support commercially reasonable financing for rehabilitation necessary to ensure the long-term sustainability of the project. Under either scenario, the owner must agree to extend affordability and use restrictions for an additional 20 years. And if an owner fails to implement the rehabilitation as required by the secretary, the secretary can take action against the owner as allowed by law. So that is good news that that authority is in there if the money isn't. Um, there's also language in there on project-based contract administrators. There is funding for project-based contract administrators, but if you're involved in this space at all around the PBCAs, you understand that um, HUD is, um, you know, there's been a lot of controversy around PBCAs and appropriators have, through the appropriations bill, directed HUD not to move forward on their latest PBCA proposal without significant adjustments. Um, there was a piece in the administration's request for PBRA for FY23 that asked for new PBRA contracts to go along with new Section 202 construction dollars. I just wanted to note that Congress rejected that, but in the future, we do expect that that proposal to pair new Section 202 senior housing capital money with project-based rental assistance as the operating subsidy, we expect that proposal to keep coming up. Um, also rejected were budget-based rent increases for new service coordinators, another of the White House's requests. Um, so next slide, please. And I'm also going to cover the Section 202 Supportive Housing for the Elderly Program. Again, we saw full renewal funding in the FY23 bill. There was some new funds for new, as you can see in the chart there, there was some new funds, not enough, but some new funds for new Section 202 homes, including another intergenerational set-aside of which we've seen intergenerational set-asides within the 202 program uh, for the last few years. And there's a lot of interest on the Hill for intergenerational housing. Um, there is $6 million in the bill to get 202 PRAC rents up before rental assistance demonstration conversion to um, ensure the long-term sustainability of those communities. There's enough funding in the 202 account to renew current service coordinator grants, but also um, we think to provide for, our, for some new service coordinators. And just to note that there is in a separate account in the Healthy Homes Program in HUD, um, there is um, additional funding for the Older Adults Home Modification Program. Um, next slide. This next slide really speaks to the, um, the threat of going back to FY22 funding levels in FY24 if some Republicans in the House get their way. And it's just very clear to those of us across the HUD programs, including in Section 8 project-based rental assistance and the Section 202 program, that going back to FY22 levels, as you can see in this chart, would be very detrimental to the programs and threaten the ability for HUD to renew all of those contracts and certainly HUD's ability to provide for new housing through the Section 202, um, new service coordinators, our we can dream, you know, new project-based rental assistance contracts. And so with that, I am going to pass it over to Elena. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm Elena Waldrum. I'm with the American Association of Service Coordinators. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what service coordination is, and then I'm going to hit, spend most of my time talking about the uh, funding and the outlook. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just really quickly, the American Association of Service Coordinators, we have about 4,000 members nationally and in some of the territories. Our members work in both family and senior housing. Um, we do a number, service coordinators are the staff that are in the buildings to assist the residents with the services they need. So for example, in family housing, they would assist with childcare, job training, financial literacy. In the senior properties, they would deal with things like linking people up with uh, long-term care services and supports, addressing concerns about fraud, um, helping them address social isolation challenges, um, and things like that. If we can go to the next slide, please. Service coordination um, is a very broad category. I wanted to make sure that you all understood just how incredibly 
um, important they are in particularly senior housing. On average, um, residents with service coordinators access 36 services per participant. Um, our members provided over nearly 11 million services um, last year, and the average age of our residents is 73 years old. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention was that the service coordination component, linking it with housing, making sure that people can get their needs met, leads to a dramatic decrease in the cost, particularly for older adults who would be nursing home eligible. So I've included um, just a quick snapshot of our national uh, information on the cost savings. Um, when you look at the services and the rental subsidy, you're looking at over $2,000 less than providing skilled nursing care for older adults or persons with disabilities who would much rather be in their own homes in the community. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just a really quick um, blurb about the impact of service coordination and the importance of linking housing and services. This was really, really highly highlighted significantly during the pandemic. Um, that was a major challenge for service coordinators across the country. If we can go to the next slide, please. So where can you find service coordinators? Service coordinators exist in the HUD Section 202 programs. They're either funded in the budget or they're funded through the grant programs. Um, there are, are over 1,500 service coordinator grants um, out there now in the field uh, for the Section 202 grant program. And then we have about 3,600 members that are funded, um, or 3,600 service coordinators that are funded through the property budget. The next place that you'll find them is in public housing. Service coordinators are funded under the Family Self-Sufficiency Program, which you'll hear more about later, um, and also under the Ross Program. It's important to realize that the public housing pop resident population is aging. And so those people that may have been low wage workers in living in public housing are now aging in place. We've seen more and more Ross program um, service coordinators that are dedicated towards helping older adults living in public housing. The next is USDA rural development properties. Um, we were very pleased to see that USDA recently released information, making sure that it was clear um, and providing guidance that people could have service coordinators in rural properties. This has been an incredible challenge for older adults in rural communities where healthcare resources have been dwindling. So um, that's another place. The other place is low-income housing tax credit properties. Um, this has always been um, a place where service coordination was desperately needed, particularly in those senior properties and properties for persons with disabilities. But unfortunately, um, the funding can be a bit of a challenge um, in the tax credits. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick um, grid of what the service coordinator funding has been. Um, unfortunately, there hasn't been enough growth in the program to really make sure that we can provide additional service coordinators to those properties um, that are currently unassisted with service coordinators. So um, in FY23 in the omnibus bill um, for the section 202 service coordinator grants, there was only $120 million. Um, overall, the majority of that will go towards renewing existing service coordinator grants. Um, the next thing is for the Ross program, we only got $35 million. And then for FSS, it was 125 million. Next slide, please. So what are the policy issues? challenging service coordination. Um, one, as I've already mentioned, is service coordination expansion. There are 2,000 properties that do not have service coordinators but are eligible for them in the 202 portfolio. So we are requesting um, going into FY24 additional funding for um, new service coordinators. The next uh, next slide, please. Service coordination workforce is a huge challenge. I strongly encourage you all to take a quick look at um, our turnover report. The service coordination turnover has a huge impact on resident care. Um, and then the next slide, please. Um, the next thing is connectivity. That's a, the ability to provide internet service in properties has um, a big impact on service coordinators and residents, especially as we move into dealing with telehealth and combating social isolation. That's it for me. If you go to my last slide, um, there is all the additional information and resources. I strongly encourage you to check out the website for reports around everything from eviction prevention to uh, food security and how service coordinators help. 
that's it. Thanks. I will turn it back over to Linda. Great. Thanks, Elena. All right. And I'm going to turn it over to Allie Cannington. And Allie is with the Kelsey and is going to talk about the Section 811 program and mainstream vouchers. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Allie and I'm with an organization called the Kelsey. As Linda said, we're an organization co-led by people with and without disabilities uh, who advance disability forward housing solutions that open doors to more homes and opportunities for everyone. Uh, I am also representing the Consortium for Constituents with Disabilities Housing Task Force and um, or what we call as the CCD Housing Task Force and CCD is the largest coalition of over 100 national organizations working together to advocate for federal policy that ensures the self determination independence, empowerment, integration, and inclusion of children and adults with disabilities in all aspects of society. Specifically with the Housing Task Force, we work to ensure that all people with disabilities have safe, stable, accessible, affordable, integrated housing that enables people to live in communities of their choosing with full access to community uh, and home and community-based services and supports. So next slide. Um, I just want to ground us really briefly in um, just the the reality facing over 100 uh, over 61 million people with disabilities across the US. Um, we are the largest um, uh, and most diverse uh, minority population in the country, and we are acutely impacted by our nation's housing crisis um, by a multitude of barriers, uh, whether that be barriers to housing cost, the highest rates of discrimination, lack of supply of housing where people with and without disabilities live uh, together where and supply where there are supportive services um, uh, that are affirmed and supported to be received in our own homes. Uh, and then, of course, the barrier of abhorrent accessibility of our housing stock across the country. And, you know, because people with disabilities, uh, we we are so diverse. Uh, we touch all of HUD, HUD programs and federally funded housing programs. But today I'm gonna specifically speak to two of the primary HUD programs that have an explicit emphasis on creating affordable, accessible, and integrated housing opportunities for adults with disabilities. Next slide. So these two programs are the HUD Section 811 program and the Mainstream Housing Choice Voucher program. And I'd like to note that these programs are specifically for people with disabilities ages 18 to 61 who are extremely low and low income. Next slide. So first, Section 811. Uh, Section 811 has, uh, has two different parts of the program. Uh, and overall, it's a federal program that assists the lowest income people with significant and long term disabilities to live independently in the community by also providing not just affordable housing, but affordable housing linked with voluntary services and supports. Uh, in the two, uh, several components of 811 exist. Uh, two main ones are the capital advance program, uh, as well as the project rental assistance program or PRA. Uh, and first, to begin with the capital advance program, uh, it created over 2,390 properties and only 501c3 nonprofits are eligible to apply for capital advance. Uh, HUD provides funding for capital costs, uh, as well as uh, the project rental assistance contract to cover annual operating costs. The capital advance primarily funds group homes and other apartment complexes that are majority uh, people with disabilities. The CCD Housing Task Force does not support new funds to be added to capital advance due to our federal policy mandates to create integrated housing options for people with disabilities. But that being said, uh, we um, do think that sustaining the existing capital advance projects are key. HUD is losing these regularly and we have recommended that RAD be a proposed solution to sustain these properties uh, of which we, were exp we are exploring with HUD currently. In terms of the project rental assistance, um, in the spirit of Valentine's Day, I put a heart just around the program so you can remember that we love PRA uh, and it creates housing, integrated housing opportunities uh, by providing project rental assistance for no more than 25% of units in multifamily properties. 
So this assistance is, is paired with capital from other local state and or federal programs. PRA is also intended to uh, support state level partnerships across services and housing uh, to substantially increase that pipeline of integrated housing units. Uh, and only housing agencies are eligible to apply for the PRA program. So funding to date um, has expected to produce over 9,000 units. Uh, so if we look at budget and advocacy, uh, which is why we're all here today, uh, in FY23 uh, budget, there was $360 million allotted. Uh, so 205 of that was for renewal and amendment, and the rest was for new. In the FY24 budget, we hope to uh, have uh, at least 460 million, 100 of which would be for um, new PRA. Uh, and lastly, we really want to, um, we think it is dire that Congress can direct HUD to issue NOFAs for the funds it has yet to spend, as well as strengthen program implementation. Uh, and HUD has indicated that PRA and capital advanced NOFAs will be coming out um, this spring or summer. Uh, next slide. We also have the mainstream housing voucher program, which is, uh, as one of my colleagues said before, is a component of the housing choice voucher program. And it specifically enables non elderly disabled people and our families on public housing authorities uh, waiting list to receive a voucher and Nationally, HUD has reported that um, as of last November, so 2022, 73% of the 69,000 vouchers were leased up. Uh, and CCD, as well as the Kelsey, is working with HUD to increase the leasing rate. So budget-wise, uh, in 2023, we got $607 million for the Mainstream Housing Voucher Program. And our, the request for FY24 is uh, to fully fund the program at $667 million to ensure people with disabilities, including those stuck in institutions and experiencing homelessness, can secure uh, safe, decent housing in the community. Uh, so thank you so much and looking forward to advocate for all of you. Great. Thank you, Allie. And Allie, I'll note there's a question for you in the chat around PRA. And I'm going to hand it over to Steve Berg with the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Thanks, Steve. Great. Thanks, Linda. And hello, everybody. Thanks for spending time with us this afternoon. Um, I'm Steve Berg with the National Alliance to End Homelessness. And I'm going to talk about funding for HUD's homelessness programs. Um, do we have more on that slide? There we go, it's coming. Um, so the, the HUD's homelessness programs are funded in the appropriations bill in the homeless assistance grants account, appropriations grants account. And that funds those two programs and assorted other activities. The continuum of care is most of the funding, um, total funding for 23 was a little over 3.6 billion and something over probably they'll spend up end up spending about 3.2 billion of that on the continuum of care. It's a competitive program that communities apply for as as an entire community they prioritize what they want the funds used for. Um, the continuum of care program funds permanent housing for people who are homeless. Uh, uh, temporary housing for the same things, uh, planning and organization around developing a homeless system that will have a good impact. Um, then the emergency solutions grants is a smaller uh, formula grant program that goes to state and local government. Uh, it was 290 million, 290 million in the most recent bill. Um, that pays for emergency shelters, it pay, pays for outreach, and it pays for various components of the rapid rehousing, uh, the rapid rehousing intervention, which communities use to get people out of homelessness quickly. Um, and then there's money for research and data projects. Uh, all of this, as I said, in 2023, added up to 3.633 billion. Um, that included, uh, funding for the continuum of care, it included 290 million for ESG. And as is the case, 
often over in recent years, the HUD homeless programs had some specific sort of congressionally directed funding through the continuum of care. So uh, in the last bill, there was 107 million for specifically for communities to improve their services to homeless youth, which is a, a part of the homelessness issue that for many years really didn't get the attention it really needed. And I think this, this demonstration, the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Project has help to uh, remedy that. Um, and it also included, last year's bill also included 75 million specifically for, for uh, capital development to, for more units for permanent supportive housing, for, uh, for permanent housing for people with disabilities. Um, we have found that, that much of the new permanent supportive housing has been funded, the, the the ongoing operating funds have been funded by the housing choice voucher program um, but in more communities as people know in the field it's hard to find places to use those vouchers uh, so congress put a little extra money in the bill for for developing new housing so for for 2024 we have this very tentative um, estimate of what's needed much of the funding much of the 3.633 billion now goes to pay ongoing rental costs for people who are moved into permanent housing uh, five and 10 and 15 years ago. Um, and they're doing really well. They're, they're not homeless anymore. Uh, the programs work really well, but they need, the, the, they're often people with severe disabilities who, are, who need ongoing rent subsidies in order to keep in the housing. Um, before they put the administration's budget out, HUD will do a lot of work to try to get a better estimate of exactly what all those renewal needs are. So this number is, is our best guess for now. And we're, we're, uh, when, when the budget comes out in about a month, we'll have a better number and then and we'll, our estimates will get more uh, precise as time goes on. So let me leave it at that. Thank you for everyone who advocates for this program and for works for the well-being of homeless people and communities across the country. Um, this is a very important part of the funding. And let me turn it back to our moderator, Linda. Great. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, I think we all share the sentiment. And I meant to say, too, we all shared um, the sentiment of Alex Hart in her presentation. And so, yeah, we all appreciate um, that everyone's on this webinar today to learn more about the program so we can all be better advocates to strengthen and expand these programs. Speaking of which, I'm going to turn it over to Vicki Watson, who's the um, Executive Director of the National Community Development Association, to talk with us about the HOME and CDBG programs. Vicki? Thank you, Linda. Uh, glad to be here today and uh, happy to talk more with you about the HOME program first. And then CDBG, there were also a couple of new programs funded in the fiscal year 23 omnibus spending bill that I'll talk a little bit about. So uh, next slide. I'm sorry, next slide. So um, before I get into the budget numbers, I wanted to give a little bit of a, a background on the HOME program for those of you who may not um, know it in depth. Um, the program, it's a federal block grant that provides annual funding to state and local governments to increase access to safe, decent, and affordable housing for low-income households. Uh, the funds can be used to construct or preserve single-family and multifamily housing for rental or home ownership. can be also used for rehab of owner-occupied housing, assistance to home buyers, and for tenant-based rental assistance. As you can see here, since 1992, uh, more than 1.4 million units of affordable housing have been produced with home funds, and the program has helped more than 400,000 families through tenant-based rental assistance. Um, it's also deeply targeted. All home funds must be used to benefit low-income families that are below 80% of area median income. And 90% uh, of rental funds must benefit very low income families. Those are families that are below 60% of area median income. And as you can see, the program has uh, consistently exceeded these requirements 
by assisting families with incomes below the, the home limits. So um, next slide. So in terms of numbers, um, the president's budget request, fiscal year 23 budget requested 1.9 billion for the program. That would have been an increase of 400 million over the previous year. However, um, the fiscal year 23 omnibus spending bill uh, only provided 1.5 billion, which is level funding for the program. Um, the Home Coalition is seeking 2.5 billion in fiscal year 24 to really ramp up the program. This would be almost an, well, actually an increase of $1 billion from this year. Uh, and just to let you know, and you guys are probably aware of this, but more funding is needed for the program more than ever due to the increase in rents, the number of people needing rental units and the increase in home prices. So we urge you to join us in advocating for the program. Next slide. So um, a little bit about the Community Development Block Grant Program. Um, CDBG is a federal block grant that provides annual funding to state and local governments to address priority needs in the areas of infrastructure, housing, public services, and economic development. It provides a flexible funding to address local-led activities for low and moderate income people. Um, in fiscal year 22 alone, over 7 million people were assisted through CDBG funded public services. And since 2005, the program has helped preserve over 1.3 units of affordable homeowner and rental housing. Next slide. So in terms of funding, um, the president's fiscal year 23 budget request did ask for an increase for the program. Um, the request was 3.77 billion, which would have been an increase of almost uh, 400 million from the previous year. However, again, Congress provided um, 3.3 billion for the program in the fiscal year 23 omnibus spending bill, which is level funding for the program. Um, for fiscal year 24, the CDBG coalition will advocate for 4.2 billion for the CDBG program. Um, this is the current authorized funding level for the program and would increase the program by uh, nearly $900 million. Um, the increased funding is needed for CDBG to help communities meet the um, dire demand for program resources and also to address underinvestment in low-income communities. So we urge you to join us in advocating for CDBG as well. So next slide. So um, the fiscal year 23 omnibus spending measure did provide funding for a couple of uh, new programs that will be administered by HUD's Office of Block Grant Assistance, which is within the um, Office of Community Planning and Development. The first program is the Yes in My Backyard or YIMBY program, um, is a new $85 million competitive grant program to incentivize affordable housing production. Eligible applicants include states, local governments, metropolitan planning organizations, and multi-jurisdictional entities. HUD is in the process of developing the notice of funding opportunity for the program, so uh, we should learn more soon in the coming months about um, what's, uh, what's in that NOFO. Next slide, please. And then the, uh, the other new program in the omnibus spending bill under the CPD office is the um, Preservation and Reinvestment Initiative for Community Enhancement or PRICE program. Uh, the program is named for Representative David Price, a Democrat from the Durham, North Carolina area who recently retired from Congress and after decades of service and advocacy as a champion for housing and community development. He also led the um, House Transportation HUD Appropriations Subcommittee for many years. And um, the PRICE program is a $225 million new competitive grant program for housing residents and communities to preserve and revitalize manufactured housing and eligible manufactured housing communities. Again, uh, HUD is currently working on the notice of funding opportunity for this. It will be administered out of the Office of Block Grant Assistance. So, um, you know, we'll have more details uh, once that NOFO is released. So I will now turn it back over to Linda. 
Great. Thank you, Vicki. And Vicki, there was a question in the chat around state allocations. I think I answered it, but you should double check my work. And okay. I'm going to pass it over to Ruth White, who is with the National Center for Housing and Child Welfare. Ruthie? Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'm going to talk about these three programs and briefly about Ross, but um, many of you who are tuning in have witnessed the rapid evolution of HUD's family unification program over the last three years. It's the folks in this picture that made that happen. So this is a mix of current and former foster youth meeting directly with HUD's Office of Public and Indian Housing. And the relationship is really so um, beautiful that these foster youth and our organization, the National Center for Housing and Child Welfare, nominated HUD for the prestigious SAMI Award two years ago, and they actually did win for the Foster Youth to Independence Initiative. So next slide. So a little bit about the Family Unification Program. So you'll be aware that this is a 30-year-old partnership between public housing authorities and local public child welfare agencies. And the idea here is to ex expedite access to housing choice vouchers to prevent family separation or to accelerate reunification for children who are in foster care. And it's actually the case that about one in 10 children who enter the foster care system were removed for the reason of inadequate housing. Um, well, we'll never calculate the moral toll uh, levied on every family, but we can calculate the amount of taxpayer dollars that are wasted on this. Um, so if we were to give every one of these families a Section 8 voucher and a, kind of a modest uh, amount of supportive services, we would save $577 million annually. And that is a direct transfer on the balance sheet um, of unnecessary foster care expenditures. And that comes down to about $61,000 per family. So we just think it's a fiscally prudent way to move forward. Next slide. Um, in addition to being a good use of taxpayer dollars, um, it's also uh, a great platform for youth who are aging out of foster care and who are facing the prospect of homelessness. So youth, uh, some of whom were in that picture that I pointed out earlier, actually designed an on-demand distribution mechanism for the vouchers um, using as a platform HUD's tenant protection account. Uh, so in 2019, there was something called the Foster Youth to Independence Initiative that was formed through a secretarial initiative, um, and uh, that was used, that used TPV vouchers. Uh, so that program has sun since sunset, and that's because appropriators went to the business of um, uh, writing, rewriting appropriations law so that vouchers can be distributed on demand. And the language you'll see in the FY 2023 Appropriations Act is non-competitive. So I'll go over how that splits out, but about half of the funding for the family unification program can be distributed in increments as small as one at a time, perfectly timed with the young person's emancipation or their need. Um, it's also the case that all folk vouchers can be recycled uh, and indeed they can be reallocated. So if you have the good problem of not having any families who are at risk of separation and you don't have any youth that are aging out alone into adulthood, then your housing authority could reallocate those vouchers to a place where there is no, more need. So that appropriators have really done a lot of great work here for these programs. So next, uh, next slide. Okay, so the gold standard here is that the uh, this funding mechanism, the Foster Youth Independence Initiative, FYI, has been codified in federal law through the Fostering Stable Housing Opportunities Amendments Act, or as we like to call it, FOSHO. But FOSHO does something even more magical. So it actually codifies um, a demonstration program that happened in 2016 that I'm happy to report our organization helped to write and deliver to Congress um, called the FUP FSS demo. Uh, so here's how it works. Vouchers for youth are time limited at three years. Um, Actually, when the program was first created, it was an 18-month voucher program, and then uh, the Financial Services Committee changed that through HOTMA, so it's now a three-year voucher. But youth can earn an extra two years of subsidy for a total of five if they voluntarily enroll in the um, Family Self-Sufficiency Program, which, as you all know, Barbara Sard nicknamed HUD's best-kept secret. So that gives them a total of 60 months in the program. Um, 
It's important to point out that uh, youth who are of color are overrepresented in terms of youth that reach adulthood in foster care without having been reunified or adopted. So this is a great way to close the racial wealth gap without running afoul of um, the Fair Housing Act because you're aiming this resource at foster youth and they tend to be overwhelmingly people of color. Next slide. So this is how the funding splits out. Um, the family unification program is a $30 million line item. Five million is distributed through a NOFO for families or youth, and that goes to PHAs as a competitive distribution. Um, half of the funding, $15 million is for youth, and that is um, non-competitive on a rolling basis. So again, you could get up to 25 at a time, 50 in the fiscal year, but you could actually order just 13 vouchers or one at a time. Um, so it should be perfectly timed with the emancipation you need, as I said. And then I will not be able to do justice to these two, uh, actually three programs under the family self-sufficiency line item. But uh, it is the case that HUD um, increased that funding to 175 million. And we're happy to report that they've also had a renewed um, interest in the uh, Jobs Plus program, which we think is great. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Lynn. Thank you, Ruthie. And you have a really kind shout out in the chat you should check out. Uh, I'm going to now pass it over to um, Debbie Fox, who is with the National Network to End Domestic Violence. Thank you so much, Linda. It's really great to be with you all today on this Friday afternoon. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of an overview of um, the national landscape on housing resources for survivors. Um, next slide, please. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the National Network to End Domestic Violence, but also we do our housing appropriations work and our housing technical assistance and training in partnership with a lot of folks around the country. So NADB, we are a membership organization um, comprised of state domestic violence coalitions. Um, so there's um, each state and territory has a coalition and then they work with their membership at the at the local level. So there's about 2000 um, domestic violence programs across the country that we're networked with. Um, I, in particular, work on a project providing technical assistance and um, policy uh, work around housing called the Collaborative Approach to Safe Housing for Survivors Project. Next slide, please. Um, so I do a lot of work at the federal level working to, to get resources, specifically housing resources for survivors, and then a lot of TA and training on the implementation on the ground. Um, and I cannot do this work alone. I work in partnership with a consortium of uh, many amazing um, organizations and technical assistance and training organizations. And we have federal partners that fund this work um, that are listed there. I won't go through all of those because we're on limited time, but I did want to elevate a couple of the TA centers in addition to the um, work that I'm doing. We have a fairly uh, newish a TA center called STARS, um, and that's part of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, and it's called the Indigenous Safe Housing Resource Center, STARS there, and so they do a lot of work around the intersection of uh, Native American and, and tribal communities and housing, which is really critical as they um, face uh, huge housing disparities, and then also we do a lot of work in collaboration with HUD TA providers and um, other uh, TA providers that are listed there that you can check out. I'll give you our Safe Housing Partnerships website at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, and so one of the reasons why we are focusing specifically on housing and population specific housing on survivors is there's a huge, huge need in our country. Um, we, NADB does a national count, a one day count of um, services um, every year. And the number one uh, resource that survivors are requesting from hotlines and our membership and our um, domestic violence shelters and housing programs is housing by far and wide. It's, it's housing is number one. Um, and then we're also getting some statistics as well from our um, our partners at the National Domestic Violence Hotline. They have an annual impact report. And we think a lot of this might be the result of just the housing crisis and really huge increases in rent. Um, and there's economic disparities based, based on gender and race and racial inequities in our country. But we are seeing um, calls to the hotline um, prior from last year to this year, there was a 114% increase in housing and homelessness requests to the hotline. Um, and then also there were, they have calls um, from survivors about housing instability. And there was a 47% increase from the prior year um, to this year. So housing is a huge issue. Um, 
and a huge economic issue and one um, that survivors um, have limited options and are unable to um, leave their harm doers if they don't have access to affordable housing. Um, so one thing that we worked on last year, not just last year, it took many, many years to, to pass the Violence Against Women Act. Um, and just as a caveat, it's, it is named that, but the act and this piece of legislation and the funding related to it um, serves people of all genders. So the, that act was passed last year in the spring of 2022. And we're happy to report that there was a lot of expanded protections for housing for survivors. So we're really trying to think of it from both a responsive place of provide, you know, providing and having housing resources, but a pre preventative measure that we want to keep survivors safely housed within their programs and if they're receiving um, federal subsidies. So with the 2022 um, passage, we have expanded those protections and they cover all federal housing programs. So survivors cannot be discriminated against um, based on their survivor status um, and they should be able to um, have their VAWA vow housing rights protected and their housing um, um, kept and, and having that as a preventative measure. It also prohib prohibits retaliation within those programs. Um, and there's also um, pieces around nuisance ordinances of so uh, local jurisdictions and um, entities are receiving federal funding. They cannot um, retaliate or um, evict people based on them seeking out help um, or calling the police or or um, other helping professions um, if they're experiencing domestic violence. So those are really key pieces that we're um, really um, happy that are in that piece of legislation. Um, and then there was also another piece that might be relevant to folks that the, the section 605 amended the McKinney definition to be more expansive and there's explicit language around um, SA sexual assault survivors. So we wanna make sure while their um, victimization looks different but they definitely are eligible and um, that's part of the definition and it's very clear now. Uh, next slide, please. I'm, I know I'm talking so fast, but there's like five minutes. All right. So now I'll talk a little bit more about federal funding and resources. Um, they're recently HUD. They've been amazing partners on this work. They recently just um, put out a notice that they have a website um, on the Violence Against Women Act. So this is a place where you all can go and visit and look at the resources. Um, and it's really also an amazing place where survivors can take a look at what's going on and you can file VAWA complaints if you think you're being um, discriminated against based on your survivor status. So please take a look at that website. A lot of great resources there. Um, and HUD also recently um, put out their community compass grant um, for their technical assistance grant. And there's a set aside for $5 million um, for the VAWA implementation. So hopefully um, lots of training and resources will be coming to communities soon once that grant is awarded. And now I'm gonna get to the federal funding, the numbers, um, next slide please. So um, the specific domestic and sexual violence funding for survivors, um, is uh, is not a lot. So um, we'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, there are some really critical funding sources though that we think are of great benefit to survivors and give them options. Um, while that's never enough, it's still really um, awesome that we have them. There is an Office of Violence Against Women funding stream for transitional housing. Um, that's $50 million. That's nationally that comes out every year. It comes out usually in March if people are interested in applying. Um, and that's a really great resource where survivors can stay up in, to two years in the program and um, take the time to heal and get holistic services um, while they recover from um, the, the harm and the abuse that has happened in their lives. There's also OVW discretionary grants like for culturally specific programs and underserved communities. Um, it's really up to the applicants how they decide to um, design their programs, but often there's um, housing related funding within those projects. Um, there is also VOCA funding, um, the Office of Victims of Crime, um, but that is allowable funding that um, states can use for housing, but it really does vary state by state how that funding is used. So it's not a um, one catch all housing stream. Um, so depending on the state, some folks focus a lot more on housing um, with that funding than other states. And then we have um, shelter-related funding, um, and it covers some housing too with the Family Violence Prevention Services Act. It's $232 million, um, which is not a lot when you think about 2,000 resource centers. Divide 232 million by 2,000, it's not a lot per shelter. Um, 
we have a requested level of 500 million, um, but we're um, at 232 and that covers, um, you know, some of the shelter budgets, obviously not all of it. And then we're really, um, have been really happy and so excited about the HUD DV bonus funds. Um, the Steve talked about earlier, the continuum of care funds that is part of that pot of money. And that's at $52 million. And that has been a game changer. And we have found it's been really critical um, during the pandemic. And somebody else, I think, already talked about vouchers, but those are accessible to survivors. And then for the fiscal year 24 forecast, we're just going to be working with you all and hoping um, that we cannot um, shrink the non-discretionary uh, defense budget and, and we can have some um, holding steady and, and maybe some increases. So I think that's it. Next, last slide is if you want to reach out to us, we do TA and training and support at the Safe Housing Partnerships, if you want to. Great. Thank you, Dee. And before I pass it over to Leslie, I'm going to just note that your sweater really matches your PowerPoint slides, Dee, and I really appreciate that. It's a hot tip I'm going to take with me to my next presentations. Um, but I'm going to pass it over to Leslie Strauss, who is going to talk about rural housing issues. Leslie is with the Housing Assistance Council. Now I'm disappointed. I didn't think to match my clothes to my presentation. Um, the Housing Assistance Council is known as HACC. We're a national nonprofit rural housing intermediary. Our work is entirely focused on rural affordable housing with a special concentration on areas of persistent poverty in rural places. I'm going to focus on rural housings at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, next slide, please. That tells you a little bit about all the different things that HACC offers. You can also explore that more at our website, which is ruralhome.org. Next slide, please. There are um, a variety of housing challenges in rural areas, including affordability issues, not surprisingly, and a disproportionate prevalence of substandard and overcrowded housing. We also see a general lack of investment, local capacity and access to capital in rural places. So USDA Rural Development tries to address rural housing unique needs by offering programs for both rental and single family, um, that's multifamily rental and single family home ownership. Um, they kind of use the terms interchangeably. Next slide, please. The president's budget for um, fiscal 23 was the best uh, request that we've seen in a long time, and it proposed some changes to address some specific issues in the rural housing stock. Unfortunately, the final fiscal 23 appropriation generally kept things at the status quo. At least we didn't go backwards for most programs. The numbers on this chart for the rental programs show um, that the administration was proposing different tactics to approach a crisis that's been building for a while and is only getting worse. And that's known as the Section 515 Rental Preservation Crisis. The Section 515 is a direct loan program. USDA makes loans itself um, compared to, for example, the 538 program, which is loan guarantees. Most of the Section 515 properties were built in the 1970s and 80s. So they're now aging out of the program. That means they will lose two types of assistance from USDA. One is the very low interest mortgage for the property owner. The second is the rental assistance if they're using USDA rental assistance for the tenants. To preserve um, 515 um, properties, the administration proposed to use, to increase the 515, 538, and multifamily preservation and revitalization, which is a mouthful better known as MPR down at the last line of that table. Um, the, the administration proposed to increase those programs. As you can see from the uh, final result in the chart, 
the appropriators liked the increase to 538. As I mentioned, that's a guarantee program. It costs the government less than making direct loans or grants, but um, Congress did not adopt the big increases for the other programs. The administration's budget also provided more for Section 521 rental assistance than had been in FY22. That was because they were proposing to make permanent about 27,000 units of rental assistance that were um, created by the American Rescue Plan, but the final appropriation did not address uh, the, the fate of those 27,000 units. USDA has managed to find enough funding to extend those the, that rental assistance through the end of this month. But in March, those properties, uh, those tenants rather, are going to see their payments go back up again. Um, not all, I should have said this sooner, uh, not all USDA properties have USDA rental assistance. Some of them have like Section 8 vouchers or state rental assistance, most of them. Um, but there are some tenants in USDA properties that don't have any rental assistance. And because most of them are elderly or um, have disabilities and live in on fixed incomes, they are um, not able to afford even their low rent. I am going to skip to the next slide because I'm running out of time, um, which just shows that for the home ownership programs, um, everything stayed the same. Congress went for the same appropriations in uh, 23 as 22. Next slide, please. Hex priorities for uh, the rental housing in, um, for fiscal 24 are to address the three problems listed at the top of this slide, preserve the existing rental properties, continue funding for those 27,000 rental assistance units and resume new construction. Section 515 hasn't had enough money for new construction since 2012. And the next slide, shows um, also that one of our priorities is local capacity building. Small towns and rural regions often need help in learning what to do um, to address their own housing problems. And I'm out of time. So the last slide shows you some of HEC's uh, resources on our website. Thank you. Back to Linda. Great. Thank you so much, Leslie. And now I'm going to turn it over to back to Kim Johnson with the National Low Income Housing Coalition, who's going to talk about and provide some resources around advocacy around affordable housing and community development. And this is a great time to get your questions ready uh, or put them in the chat, because um, we'll have some time for those um, after Kim's presentation. Thank you, Kim. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Linda, and thanks to all of our presenters for joining for such an informative um, uh, webinar today. Uh, it was really great hearing, you know, all of the good things that come out of this uh, federal government funding, right? Um, and so I, I think one of the things that this has really driven home for me is that, you know, appropriations is not just about numbers. It's about the real life impact that these programs have on people and their communities. We know that when people have safe, affordable, accessible housing, they are more likely to do better in school. They are more likely to be food secure. They are more likely to have good health outcomes. And so it is vitally important that we see increased funding from year to year for these USDA and rural housing programs. And so I wanted to draw attention um, to uh, CHCDF's annual 302B letter, which I am attempting to send in the chat. Sorry, I have two screens pulled up. Um, <laughs> I'm everywhere. Um, so I just popped in the chat uh, CHCDF's annual 302B letter, which urges Congress to inc provide increased funding in fiscal year 2024 for HUD and USDA's invaluable affordable housing, homelessness, and community development programs. But also importantly, that letter calls on Congress to reject any attempts to slash funding for those important programs. 
It's important to keep in mind that decreased funding means that fewer people are going to be able to afford rent at the end of the day, that fewer people experiencing homelessness will be able to get the assistance they need to find and maintain stable housing. It, there are just huge consequences when these programs don't receive the funding that they need in order to operate sustainably, like Marsh says in the chat. And so please, if you have not joined that letter yet, please do. Um, and I wanted to flag a resource from the National Low Income Housing Coalition that is specifically focused on providing those, um, oh gosh, it's hard to do this with, uh, do, do two things at once. Um, but I also wanted to flag a resource, a budget toolkit um, from the National Low Income Housing Coalition that has things like talking points, social media messages, draft op-eds to um, newspapers that people can use to take action and to weigh in with their members of Congress on the importance of these vital federal funds for affordable housing and community development and homelessness. Um, so please uh, do take action, do reach out to your members of Congress about the importance of these programs, about the, the impact that these programs have on people in your communities and families um, that you know. Uh, making that personal connection can make a world of difference for members of Congress to really understand the tangible impact of these programs. This isn't just about numbers. Um, it is unconscionable to balance the nation's budget on the backs of the nation's lowest income people. And so we need to keep up the fight to ensure that we see increased funding for these programs from year to year. Um, so that is my call to action. Um, and I will turn it back over to Linda to take us through Q&A. Super, thank you, Kim, very much. Okay, so there is a question in the Q&A box, D. Oh, D is typing an answer. All right, anyone have any questions they want to ask live? Oh, here's a great one from Melinda in the chat. And Elena, um, how, the question is, how do we apply for the service coordinator grant? Sorry about that. I was typing in the chat as well. <laughs> um, so there are a couple of ways. It depends on what type of property you have. If you have a Section 202 property, um, you would be able to apply through the Section 202 Service Coordinator Grant Program. As I mentioned, there were not uh, there was not a lot of funding made available, so we only think that there will be a few new service coordinator grants coming out. Most of the dollars will go towards renewal. That's why it's really important for FY24 to get that additional funding um, so that we can provide up to 400 new service coordinators. Um, if you're interested in that, please feel free to, to reach out to me. I could definitely talk to you some more about that. If you're interested in any of the service coordinator programs that are uh, in public housing, um, you can definitely reach out to me. Um, you can also reach out to the folks uh, on the call who work in the public housing area um, and deal specifically with Ross and FSS. I will also mention, because I didn't get to mention this during my, my quick rant, ramble, um, there are, we do have a couple members who have been funded through the CDBG program and they're community-based service coordinators. So that is a new uh, thing that we're looking at in terms of having people in communities to help people that are homeowners and aging in place. So I'll stop there, but definitely please reach out to me and I will um, try to hook you up with the right people. Thanks, Linda. Super. And there's a question, um, please any of our panelists jump in. And there's a question, um, has any organization used the pay for success model in their housing and how has it worked? All right, I'm going to answer a different question in the chat. And if anyone has anything to say on pay for success, if you could pop something into the Q&A box, that would be great. Um, Melinda is asking, uh, saying we're a 202. Are you saying it's not likely we'll get funding? No, if you're a 202, Congress has been very committed, just like it has for project-based rental assistance under the Section 8 program, um, for voucher renewals, um, Congress has been um, really committed to renewing all the funding needed to renew Section 202 contracts. What we are um, most worried about at the moment is funding um, available for new Section 202 housing. So funding that provides nonprofits with capital money to build the housing and then the ongoing operating subsidy. Um, if we go back to FY22 levels, 
it is very unlikely that we'll have any money for new 202 funding. And for some programs, it's going to be, um, we're going to have to um, take from other programs that are providing new assistance just to make sure we can renew um, the ones, the households that are already getting assisted. So we're not saying that, but we're saying that Appropriators really need to hear from folks about how important these programs are and that um, residents um, benefit tremendously from them. Other questions? Um, Arlene, do you, um, I can't really read your, um, <laughs> So um, I didn't really read your whole comment, Arlene, but I understand uh, what you're saying. And I think I mentioned this on my slide, but didn't, I wrote this on my slide on PBRA funding, but didn't say it. Yeah, about a billion dollars or so of Section 8 PBR funding was out of emergency funding um, for disaster relief, from a disaster relief portion of the bill. And so, yeah, appropriators are going to have to account for that um, this coming year. And also with the slowing of the housing market, right, we're going to have fewer FHA receipts possibly. Um, appropriators often rely on some receipts from the um, FHA from single family their single family mortgage products to um, undergird um, some of the HUD funding and so we are really entering a lot of um, big questions for this appropriation season. Any other questions? The um, not seeing any, I just want to, uh, we put in the chat or Kim put in the chat a couple of times, the website for the campaign for housing and community development funding. We are a really broad network. Um, one of us knows something about the program that you're interested in, knows providers who are doing it, knows um, details about the regulations, about the statutory requirements, et cetera. And so um, linking to that campaign um, page is a great first step for learning more. And above all else, we really um, look forward to having you work with us side by side this year as advocates for housing and community development funding in the FY24 appropriations bill. Anything final from you, Kim? Okay, so um, nothing else from Kim, but I do wanna give a shout out to Kim. Kim Johnson is the one, she compiled the slide tag, she managed the registration. So huge thanks, um, Kim, to you and the Low Income Housing Coalition for doing all that coordinating on behalf of this webinar. And with that, Thank you everyone for joining us today.